Hello all, I'm Professor Dragon Illich from the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine and welcome to this module where we're going to be exploring issues around screening, uh, specifically sensitivity, specificity and ROCs. So as always, um, here we have the objectives for module 3. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time um, on sensitivity and specificity again. Um, I, I will just uh, recap in one slide for, for both of these concepts. Um, however, if you want to revisit um, the previous slides um, and presentations on sensitivity and specificity, uh, please feel free to do so. So in terms of sensitivity, um, what we're basically looking at um, is how good the test is at correctly identifying those with a disease. So basically, the true positive um, is, is, uh, is what we're after. So um, if we uh, had a particular test and we're already able to identify um, how many patients actually have the disease, um, what the sensitivity is telling us is of all of those uh, patients that do have the disease, how good is the test at correctly identifying those that test positive. On the other hand, uh, we've got specificity. Um, so specificity is looking at um, or trying to identify how good the diagnostic test is at correctly identifying those without the disease. So essentially it's looking at how effective is it in obtaining a true negative. So again, the hypothetical situation where let's say we had 100 people and we know that they don't have a particular disease, um, we run this particular test over them, what we're trying to identify is this area here. So of all those that don't have the disease, how many actually come up negative on the test result? And obviously we want to have that as high as possible. So in the previous um, presentation we talked about uh, sensitivity and specificity, how they don't change. Predictive values, um, that is the post-test probability does change um, with the population. As such, what we um, want to rely on more so, I guess, is the, um, the likelihood ratios. Uh, so that's taking into account the sensitivity and specificity of a test, um, and we can directly apply it to various populations. So I guess a couple of things to get out of this. Um, a likelihood ratio of one um, indicates that the test will, won't provide any change in terms of the post-test probability. So the, doing the test is, is fairly useless. Uh, it won't either rule in or rule out the particular um, illness or disease. Um, a positive uh, likelihood ratio approaching 10 um, will indicate a large increase in the um, uh, probability that the patient does have uh, the, 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 the disease or condition. Um, a negative likelihood ratio um, close to zero or as close to zero as possible um, suggests that the test is, um, is a strong test um, and is a worthwhile test at ruling out the disease. So here we have a nomogram and um, I guess this is more so just from a, um, a theoretical point of view but I guess intuitively you would know um, that putting together a series of tests um, would obviously increase or decrease the likelihood of um, you confirming um, the presence or absence of a um, particular disease or condition. Um, so all a nomogram is doing it um, is doing it from a graphical point of view. Um, so let's say we had a, um, a particular disease, the, the pretest probability here. Um, so let's say yeah, there's a one in ten chance, one in ten. Um, uh, chance of um, a disease occurring, so we've got a pretest probability of 10%. Um, we have a, um, a particular test, and the um, uh, and the positive likelihood ratio is 10. Uh, so we plot 10 there. So just by drawing, hopefully a somewhat straight line, um, we can see that we get the post-test pr probability of 60%. So hopefully it demonstrates that. Um, a, a high um, positive likelihood ratio uh, demonstrates 
the, the value um, in, in ruling in a disease. Similarly, um, let's say we take the same um, example, 10% um, pretest probability, so a prevalence of a disease in Australia being 10%, um, and the negative uh, likelihood ratio, um, let's say, is um, uh, 0 0.05. So again, if we were to draw a straight line whoops, uh, between the two, you could see that this particular test, so this hypothetical test, um, positive likelihood ratio of 10, suggests that it's a strong test to rule in the disease, but also similarly, because the negative likelihood ratio is approaching zero, so in this case it's 0 0.05, um, the, the, the post-test probability uh, goes down to 0.5%. So we've gone from 10% to 05 So essentially a good test to either rule in or rule out a particular disease. So what I just briefly want to cover um, are ROC um, or receiver operator characteristic uh, curves. Um, so they're really useful when we're trying to determine a particular cutoff um, for, for tests. Um, um, and, and we'll show you in the next slide um, how they're, um, or what they look like and how they're conducted. Um, but essentially, they plot sensitivity on one side and plot um, a false positive um, on the other side. So if you can think of, of a particular example um, for, for pathology tests, so you know, the classic example is the PSA test. Um, currently, um, uh, if you look at guidelines, um, the, the threshold in, in terms of um, a PSA test being defined as um, abnormal um, is above four nanograms per, per um, millimolar. Um, <clears throat> however, by reducing the threshold, so let's say going from four to three, um, what impact would that make? Um, similarly, increasing the threshold, so let's say we go from four to six nanograms per mil, um, whether that would make um, uh, a, a huge impact in terms of its sensitivity and um, uh, uh, false uh, positive rate. So here we have an example of a um, ROC uh, curve. So as I mentioned, we've got sensitivity um, on the y-axis, um, one minus specificity um, on the uh, on the x-axis, and so what we've got, I guess, are, are three lines. So this line here, so any test that when you plot it um, results in this sort of line um, essentially tells us that the test is useless. Um, so there's no predictive value. So it's just like having a likelihood ratio of one. What, what we do want to see um, is something that resembles this ideal test. Um, so um, great at ruling in the disease as well as ruling out the disease if possible. Um, in reality, what do we see? Most tests sort of are somewhere in and around there. So obviously the, the higher the volume um, under this curve, um, the better uh, the test. So here's a particular example of um, uh, prostate cancer and, and what we discussed a couple of slides ago. So your, your classic PSA test, um, depending on, on where you, you cut it off, um, is this one in, in the uh, purple. So as you can see, not that far off <laughs> um, from the um, uh, 45 degree angle. Um, so that's why we've seen innovation in this area. So rather than just looking at total PSA, looking at different variations of it and seeing if we could potentially increase um, uh, the, the, the area under this curve and by doing so, increasing the, the value um, of, the, um, of the test. Uh, so in the yellow we've got a percentage of free PSA um, and then in the green we've got um, looking at PSA density um, over time. Um, interestingly, uh, the one in the blue uh, seems to represent um, uh, the PS, uh, PCA3 uh, score um, in terms of the genes. So again, just useful in terms of differentiating between different types of tests and their potential value um, uh, in the clinical environment.
So the last thing that I just want to touch base on was um, the criteria that we use for screening um, and how um, the, the accuracy, um, uh, you know, the sensitivity, the specificity of a test um, can impact upon whether or not we um, uh, roll out a screening uh, protocol or a screening regime um, at a population level or otherwise. Um, so this is um, similar to the Gates article, um, but what I've done here is pull it from the, um, the Wilson criteria from the WHO. So fairly similar in the first um, uh, criteria that the condition should be an important health problem. Um, we should understand the natural history of the condition. So if we can understand it, obviously we can intervene. Um, I guess this, this one's fairly critical. Um, there should be a recognisable latent or early symptomatic stage. So the longer that early symptomatic as opposed to asymptomatic stage, um, the better it is that we can um, intervene in that, um, in that area. Um, and here's where um, a lot of um, screening programs fall down. Um, so we're arguing that the test um, should be fairly easy to perform and interpret but more so um, should be acceptable to the patient, should be reliable, um, should be valid in the sense of having a, um, a good um, uh, sensitivity and specificity in terms of its diagnostic characteristics. Um, so if, if we relate it to, um, let's say prostate cancer, there's a question mark around that. Um, if we relate to something like the FOBT and, and screening for uh, colorectal cancer, um, one could argue the opposite. Uh, number five, you know, if we do identify the disease at an early stage, is there an acceptable treatment recognised um, for the disease? Um, and more so, um, the, the treatment should be more effective if it's um, obviously started earlier um, than later. Um, number seven is where we get involved with policy and politics. Um, so hopefully Given that there is sufficient data on the um, early detection, the diagnosis um, and the treatment, um, that there is a, um, a policy developed on who should be, I think in this case, not only treated, but firstly screened as well. Um, diagnosis and treatment, unfortunately, bottom line always occurs, so should be cost effective. Um, so cost effective, I guess, from a number of um, viewpoints, whether it be the patient, um, the hospital system, um, or, or, or the clinician uh, viewpoint as well. And ideally, um, all this should be a, a fairly continuous process. That, so that's uh, it for me uh, for today. Hopefully you found that useful. And as always, please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Thank you.